Welcome to the second season of Murder 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Growing up in the UK in the 1980s, Joanna Dennehy was a caring and sensitive child. She was polite, got good grades in school, and enjoyed playing hockey. She was a young, bright blue-eyed girl, her warm smile framed by chubby cheeks. But then, something changed as she entered her teenage years. She started skipping school and delved into drugs and alcohol. At 16, she began dating a man in his 20s, five years older than her. She met John while she was out walking her dog. The couple had two girls, the first when Joanna was 17. Their relationship was turbulent and on and off for 12 years. One night in 2009, Joanna returned home after a night of drinking and pulled a dagger out of her boot and plunged it into the living room floor and yelled, I wish I could kill someone. That was the final straw for John. He took the girls and left, cutting off all contact with Joanna. Now alone with her thoughts, perhaps that was a trigger that spiraled her into a life of crime and destruction. She had a black star tattooed on her right cheek, perhaps a symbol of what was to come. In 2012, at the age of 30, Joanne had served time for drugs and theft. The Peterborough Telegraph described how in February, she was admitted to the Peterborough Hospital Psychiatric Unit. There, she was diagnosed with multiple personality disorders. She was psychopathic, antisocial, emotionally unstable, and obsessive-compulsive. Common behavior psychopathy can include disregarding or violating the rights of others, difficulty showing remorse or empathy, and reoccurring problems following the law. Joanna had recently been given a 12-month community order for her assault and being in control of a dangerous dog. By now, Joanna was considered a complex case, but was mistakenly assigned to a less experienced offender manager. She was on probation, but missed her appointments. A review of her file later on stated that she had the potential to cause serious harm, but was unlikely to do so unless there was significant change in circumstances. It appears circumstances changed in Joanna's life, a perfect storm that evolved into violence. Joanna met Gary Richards, who went by the nickname Stretch, which referred to his height of seven foot three, a tall man with a criminal past who lived in Kington. The police in nearby Herefordshire knew him well as he'd been arrested many times for burglaries and theft, and I'm sure they didn't miss him when he moved three hours east to Peterborough, north of London. Out of prison and on probation, Joanna approached a property company about renting a room for people with limited resources. The Daily Mail reported that Paul Creed, one of the business partners, was reluctant to rent a room to Joanna, but his partner Kevin Lee wanted to give her a chance. 
Kevin managed many properties, including the one on Rolston Garth that Joanna moved into. Kevin had a personality that touched others, and he had a soft spot for Joanna. At 48, he was tall and good-looking, with short dark hair, dark eyes, and was married with children. Also residing at the rooming house was Lucas Lebowski. He had moved from Poland eight years earlier and worked in a warehouse. On March 18, 2013, 31-year-old Lucas met Joanna. Court records reveal that he was immediately telling friends his life was beautiful now that he had an English girlfriend. The very next day, Joanna lured him to her rented room. She had gone to the dark side and had an evil plan that Lucas knew nothing about. She had invited him to her room with one purpose in mind, to kill him. She stabbed him once through the heart. Then she unceremoniously dumped his body in a trash can. Then, as if to share her accomplishment, she brought over a 14-year-old girl that she had befriended, lifted the lid on the trash can, and showed her Lucas's body. Now Joanna had to find a way of disposing of him. She borrowed money from her landlord, Kevin. Then she and Gary took a taxi and purchased a small, compact green Astra. That evening, she and Gary loaded up Lucas's body and drove around the outskirts of Peterborough. Gary had lived in the area earlier and knew a spot. They drove to Thorny Dyke. A rural road cuts through miles of farmer's fields. Along the road ran a ditch. They pulled the Astra over and heaved Lucas's body out and dumped him in the ditch. Joanna worked for Kevin as an enforcer in the complexes he managed. Among the tenants, she had become known as the man-woman, who intimidated the tenants into doing what Kevin wanted. She told Kevin a tale of surviving childhood abuse and that she had murdered her father and served time in prison. Well, yes, she had served time in prison, but the rest couldn't be further from the truth. Her father was alive and kicking. Her psychopathic lies drew Kevin in, and he was infatuated with her. On March 20th, Kevin confessed to his wife that he was having an affair with Joanna. Joanna had gotten a taste for blood, and she enjoyed it. A week later on March 29th, it was Good Friday, and many of the citizens of the UK we're looking forward to a long weekend, an extra day off work to spend time with friends and family. But Joanna had a different kind of weekend planned. She had moved on to another one of Kevin's properties, a rundown complex and byfield. The two-story row houses were clad in faded red brick dotted by white window frames. John Chapman had a room at Byfield he had served in the Navy in the Falkland War and had fallen on hard times and drowned his memories with alcohol. Kevin had served the tenants with eviction notices and Joanna had tried forcing John to move out. She told him she would get him out by any means. He referred to her to his friends as the Mad Woman and they were concerned for his safety and they had a right to be. Joanna visited John in his room. He was likely sleeping when she stabbed him in the heart. And it didn't stop. She stabbed his chest four more times. Then she used a knife to stab him in the neck, severing his carotid artery. John didn't have a chance to defend himself. He died at 56. Joanna stole John's phone and called Gary. Meanwhile, Leslie Layton had a room on the same floor as John, and after the murder, 
Joanna called him to come to John's room. Leslie didn't recoil in horror or call police, but rather whipped out his cell phone and at precisely 7.32 a.m. snapped a photo of John's body. Joanna then called Kevin suggesting a rendezvous back at Rolleston Garth. Kevin was excited for his date with Joanna. He arrived expecting an evening of kinky sex. Instead, Joanna stabbed him in the chest. Kevin tried to defend himself. She stabbed him four more times, puncturing his heart and lungs. Kevin died at 48. Joanna borrowed a tarp from Robert Moore, another male that had become infatuated with her. She retrieved a dress she owned, a slinky black sequin number, and dressed Kevin's body in the dress. Gary and Leslie accompanied her to Nubra. Leslie drove Kevin's car with his body in the trunk. When they reached Yaxley, Leslie stayed in the car, while Joanna and Gary dumped Kevin's body in a ditch. Then they set fire to Kevin's car, and the threesome returned to Byfield to retrieve John's body. That night, they drove back to Thorny Dyke, and in the exact same location, they dumped Lucas, they dumped John. Two bodies left in a ditch on a lonely stretch of country road. Then Joanna and Gary went on the run, inspired to become a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde. They spent the next two nights at Robert's. John's disappearance had made the evening news. On April 1st, Leslie was visited by police in the search for John. He told them that he hadn't seen Joanna in days. While Leslie was talking to police, his phone rang. It was Joanna. He stayed quiet and didn't tell police what he knew. After they left, Leslie called Joanna back to update her on the police investigation. Joanna and Gary headed east for two hours. Gary stopped to burglarize a home. Then they spent the night at a friend's in King's Lion and boasted about the murders and said that the bodies would never be found. Then Joanna saw herself on TV. She was a wanted woman, and that excited her. Joanna and Gary returned to Peterborough and spent a night back at Robert's. The next morning, the couple set up for Hereford, an area Gary knew well. There, he burglarized another house, they continued on to Gary's hometown of Kington, where he had contacts to sell the stolen goods. Afterwards, Joanna told Gary, now that he'd had his fun, it was her turn. She wasn't done killing. She had aspirations of being a serial killer. Joanna wanted her next victim to be random, an innocent man. She was stabbed to death. Gary spotted a potential victim, a man walking his dog, and asked her, Will he do? He was Robin Veriza, a retired fireman, who at 63 was in great physical shape. Gary stopped the car and watched Joanna sneak up behind him. She pulled out a knife and lunged it into Robin's back. Shocked, he turned around to see who was attacking him and asked her what she was doing. She stabbed him a second time in the upper arm and told him, I am going to kill you. Robin fought back, likely surprising Joanna. Robin was moving down the road as Joanna kept trying to attack him. Gary followed slowly in the car. Then another car pulled up, and Joanna retreated and got back into the car with Gary. She glanced over at the driver in the other car and smiled. 
Robin was a strong man. The first stab wound had gone through his back and into his chest, fracturing a rib and bruising his lung. He managed to make it home and called police and told them that he'd been attacked by a woman with a star tattoo on her face. Robin was lucky and survived. Joanna wasn't scared off by the close call. Rather, she was fueled by drugs and alcohol and ordered Gary to keep driving until they found her next victim. Gary drove to an area where he knew a path was used by dog walkers. There, 56-year-old John Rogers was walking his dog. Joanna exited the car, snuck up behind him, and stabbed him in the back. When he turned around to face her, she stabbed him again and again. She pushed him backwards and kept stabbing him. She attacked him in a frenzy, stabbing him over 30 times. Leaving him for dead, she picked up his dog and fled in the car with Gary. Both of John's lungs had collapsed. He had knife wounds to his back, chest, and abdomen. His bowel was punctured, and nine of his ribs had been fractured. Miraculously, John survived, thanks to the quick and excellent medical attention he received. Police responded to the scene where Robin had been attacked. When a call came over the radio, a second man had been attacked. The Hereford Times reported that two beat cops heard a call come over the radio about an Astra car that was connected to two stabbings and potentially a murder, and that Gary was linked and maybe with Joanna, a woman with a star tattoo on her cheek. The cops knew Gary from his previous run-ins with the law. Minutes later, the beat cops spotted the Astra and approached it. But Gary was nearby trying to sell his stolen loot, while Joanna sat in the front seat. They spotted her distinctive tattoo. Joanna remained calm and composed as she was arrested. Then officers spotted a car being driven with the man they knew to be associates of Gary's and wondered if he might be with them. They stopped the car. Gary jumped out and took off running. He didn't get far before running into the firearms team who were hunting him. He surrendered, telling them that he was Britain's most wanted. Within two hours of the first stabbing, both Joanna and Gary were in custody. Their reign of terror had come to an end. Joanna's crime shook Britain. She was charged with three counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and three counts of preventing burial. In a surprise twist, Joanna pled guilty. Perhaps it was her last chance to exert any control she felt she still had. Four months later at her sentencing, the judge acknowledged her psychopathic personality and the fact that she was a pathological liar before sentencing her for the premeditated murders to a whole life order. The sentence means she will never be released. She was also sentenced to life imprisonment for the two attempted murders and 12 years for three counts of preventing burial. Also charged as accomplices were Gary, Leslie, and Robert. Gary was convicted of three counts of preventing burial and two counts of attempted murder and sentenced to a minimum of 19 years. Although Leslie had deleted the photo of John's body from his phone, it was recovered by forensic analysis. He was found guilty of preventing burial and sentenced to 14 years. 
Robert was convicted of assisting an offender and sentenced to three years. The son reported that Joanna's mother Kathleen told a documentary, The girl that killed those people is not my daughter. My daughter's that nice 16-year-old that never came home. To me, she doesn't exist anymore. I don't ever want her to come out of jail. The world's safer with Joanna in it. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. We're taking a short holiday break and we'll be featuring two of Murder in 20's most popular episodes. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Junie Buenono. She was a nurse and serial killer who almost got away with it. Poisoning for profit, she murdered her husband, boyfriend, and son. Then she bombed her next victim and became the first woman executed in Florida. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Vaseline Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murder20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>